Hello everybody, welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips and um, today's topic is HDL cholesterol, very misunderstood, and another attempt to develop a drug that increases HDL level has failed according to an announcement that was made at the American College of Cardiology annual meeting which just took place a few weeks ago. Uh, the drug, abacitrapib, reduced LDL cholesterol and more than doubled HDL cholesterol. But in a study including over 12,000 patients, the drug made no difference in outcomes. In just a couple of comparisons, 256 people taking the drug had heart attacks, 255 taking placebo, 92 patients taking the drug had a stroke, 95 in the placebo group, 434 patients taking the drug died from cardiovascular disease, 444 patients taking placebo. Uh, barely statistic, not even statistically significant. So Eli Lilly, the maker of this drug, um, stopped the trial back in October of last year. This isn't surprising, and it's not the first time it's happened. At least two other drugs designed to increase HDL cholesterol have failed. Uh, Dalsatropib was ineffective, and Torsetropid, I think Torsetropid, I never can pronounce these right, uh, made by Pfizer, lowered LDL levels by 46%, and when it was used in combination with Lipitor, it raised HDL by 106 milligrams per deciliter, but patients taking the drug combo had a higher risk of cardiovascular events and death than those taking placebo. Now cardiologists seem to be completely mystified at this. Peter Libby, a cardiologist at Harvard, said that this drug was, quote, the great hope, and that, quote, all of us would have put money on it. Another cardiologist, Dr. Paul Thompson at Hartford Hospital, seemed to have a more realistic view of this. He said it may be that LDL is, level is less important than how it gets changed. Amen to that. In other words, all methods of changing biomarkers do not result in the same outcome. Avacitropib is one of a new class of cholesterol-lowering drugs called PCSK9 inhibitors. The FDA approved this particular class of drugs because it was an alternative for lowering cholesterol levels for people who could not tolerate statin drugs. The reason why there are ongoing clinical trials is that the makers of these drugs are hoping that they can get the drug approved for a new use, which is to increase HDL cholesterol. Um, but unfortunately, uh, they would have to show that this lowers the incidence or risk of cardiovascular events and death, and so far, uh, that has not happened. Now, why are they so persistent? I think it's all in the money. Uh, the drugs can cost up to $14,000 per year, and statin drugs are comparatively really, really cheap. So there's a lot of money to be made if they can get something done here. I'm confident that they'll eventually prevail. Uh, not because I think that the drugs are any good, but because of just simple perseverance and the fact that almost all drugs that are submitted for approval or for secondary uses are approved by the FDA. There's an article in the Health Briefs Library posted now. I did a video clip on it um, several months ago, and you can the, the raw data is amazing. They, I, I think what's going to happen at some point in time is Merck and these other companies will just send a, 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 an email to the FDA announcing the drugs that they're going to be marketing so that they can give them a heads up to look for side effects. But anyway, so I, I think it'll probably be approved. I, I also think that the drug, no matter how many clinical trials they do, will not result in meaningful improved improvement in health outcomes. The reason is that the drugs are based on a faulty theory, which is that um, it's, and it's based on observation. In other words, observational studies show that people in the general population who have high HDL levels have a lower incidence of cardiovascular events. Therefore, the logic goes, if you get people's HDL cholesterols higher, however you do it, then you should see um, a reduction in incidence. The problem is it just doesn't work. In addition to the trials already mentioned, the ACCORD trial concluded that phenofibrate increased HDL did not reduce cardiovascular events. Um, they always have these big acronyms here. The HPS2 Thrive trial showed that nicotinic acid increased HDL cholesterol but increased the event, uh, in incidence of cardiovascular events. The AIM High trial also used nicotinic, nicotinic acid, raised HDL no effect on event incidents. So it should be enough to put the matter to rest. I mean, they, but I just don't see them giving it up. The potential for profit is likely to eclipse both common sense and patient safety. 
Now, concern about HDL levels is really not warranted, but concern about plasma cholesterol levels is. A study of over 356,000 men between the ages of 35 and 57 showed that serum cholesterol levels are directly related to the risk of coronary heart disease and CHD deaths. The authors wrote, these data of high precision show that the relationship between serum cholesterol and CHD is not a threshold one with increased risk confined to the two highest quintiles, but is rather a continuously graded one that powerfully affects risk for the great majority of middle-aged American men. In other words, what, what they're saying is you don't have to wait till your cholesterol is like hugely high. In a dose-dependent manner, the higher it gets, the higher your risk. But not all methods of lowering plasma cholesterol result in the same outcomes. For example, statins lower cholesterol, but they don't significantly change the incidence of events. Crestor reduces the risk of major cardiovascular events by 1.2%. Lip, uh, Lipitor at about 1.6% is slightly better, but here's the thing. Um, statins do not reduce mortality when used for primary prevention, even in high-risk patients. All right, so they're next to useless. On the other hand, take a look at Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn's research. His long-term study using diet to treat coronary artery disease resulted in completely different outcomes. Within, with his first group of patients, uh, cholesterol dropped after adopting the diet, an average of over 100 milligrams per deciliter, and it remained that way at five years of follow-up. He then reported the results from 198 additional patients, most of whom, 90% of whom were compliant on the diet, 0.6% incidence in the risk of Korean, uh, incidence of, uh, for compliant patients versus 62% incidence in patients who were not compliant with the dietary plan, which lowers cholesterol. It's clear that a better way to lower cholesterol is to change the diet rather than taking the drugs. There's considerable misunderstanding. I want to come back to this HDL thing just to wrap up here. It's, it's, there's a whole lot of misunderstanding about the importance of higher HDL levels, which is the driving force behind both all of these expensive and futile efforts to develop drugs and supplements to increase it. But it also results in bad advice for people who eat a health-promoting diet. Um, the people who eat a low-fat plant-based diet, for example, and have low HDL levels are often told that their levels are too low and that places them at a higher risk for a cardiovascular event. But the problem with that theory, again, is that the role of HDL is to clean up inflammation and remove LDL cholesterol from the bloodstream. So once you adopt a low-fat plant-based diet, your LDL cholesterol goes down significantly in most cases and therefore the liver will produce less. HDL. Um, studies have shown that individuals who eat a plant-based diet have lower risk of coronary artery disease, even though most of them also have low levels of HDL cholesterol. Additionally, a growing body of research is showing that it's not how high your plasma HDL levels are, it's how metabolically powerful the HDL molecules are. It's not the size of the army, it's the force of the army in this case. Cholesterol efflux capacity is a marker for HDL function and it's a measurement, measurement for reverse cholesterol transport. High efflux capacity is related to lower risk of cardiovascular disease and events. One study concluded cholesterol efflux capacity for macrophages, is a metric of HDL function, has a strong inverse association with both carotid intima media thickness and the likelihood of angiographic coronary artery disease independent of the plasma levels of HDL. Studies show that, quote, cholesterol efflux capacity plays a more important role in preventing coronary artery disease and events independent of cholesterol levels. So if you want to learn how to increase the metabolic activity of your HDL cholesterol, I've posted another article in the Health Race Library that will talk about that very issue. So the better strategy for lowering cholesterol and the risk for coronary artery disease and events and death is to adopt a low-fat plant-based diet. Now, this plan is never going to generate a billion dollars like a blockbuster drug will, but I think it can improve the health of millions of people and it will save billions of dollars in health care costs. So much superior option to what we're doing right now. So I hope that clears up some of the confusion. This comes up in the office every day here talking about this HDL cholesterol issue. And I um, hope that makes things a little more clear. All right, that's all for today and for the week. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it. And I'll be back to you on Tuesday with more news.